So I was reading some statistics about uh, something called echo anxiety. It's an actual diagnosis. And it's on the rise. Kind of epidemic. I think it's probably pretty high among certain groups and then non-existent among others. So, <laughs> um, and, and they're training therapists to deal with people with echo anxiety. I'm not sure what the treatment would be. A walk in the park, maybe. <laughs> maybe that would make it worse. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and um, for most people, though, our sense of environment, ecology, climate change, which seems really big news, is news. Because for most of us in our lives, we're living our lives as is. Yeah. Unless you're living in Australia right now, it's not really affecting you in a serious way. Um, <clears throat> so we kind of think, well, you know, climate change is a really big topic and so important, and most people say it's the number one issue for our century, if not for the next 10 years. <clears throat> and then we go and we meditate. And in this uh, magazine, Dharma magazine, there is a title of an article said, does sitting on your zafu, zafu is a meditation cushion, does sitting on your zafu help climate change? <laughs> and I thought it was, you know, a pretty good title. Um, and the answer pretty much was no, <laughs> of that point of view. So we ask ourselves, and you know, if this practice is so important to us, and the world is so important to us, Basically, the real vital question is, how do we overlap those two concerns so that they're not really two? <clears throat> and there's a certain trend in the past 30 years or so towards a type of um, description of what's called engaged Buddhism. Engaged, meaning like involved with things, whether it's climate or whether it's social action or whatever type of uh, issues, usually social issues. And there are a lot of groups or some groups here that I'm aware of and some people I know who are very involved in kind of activism and having their practice or their dharma inform their activism in some way. Sometimes they go and they, I don't know, pick olives with Palestinians or um, go to protests or go to the separation wall and go to villages and things like that. So it's kind of political activism on one hand. I haven't really heard of climate activists here in Israel. Um, I'd, I'd like to do some bicycle activism for more bike lanes, but I don't think it would be very popular. Um, and that, and yet, sometimes it seems like it's hard to have that overlap without it seeming really artificial or forced, and then you've got this dharma going on, and then you've got all this really strong emotions. You know, strong emotions, even bordering on anger. <coughs> and opposition. And that's a, a risk <clears throat> that as soon as we get into activism, we've lost the dharma, we've lost the oneness, the unity. And it becomes very divisive. And the dharma helped to inform a sense of like, oh, uh, love and compassion. We really want to work to help and to reduce suffering. But then when you're in the field, a lot of the conditioning of us and them comes up. <clears throat> um, 
And even when we talk about climate, the conditioning of us and them can come up. Like it's the fault of, you know, this excessive use of fossil fuels and, you know, our habits as society and the oil companies and natural gas company and it's just going on and on and lack of political will. And, and so um, one of the approaches that a lot of people do is to say, okay, what can I do as an individual? So I'll work on my own life. And there's a climate scientist named Bill McKibben, and he's like the founder of the whole sort of, he's been working on this issue for 40 years. And he expressed in a talk that even if 15% of the whole population changes their lifestyle radically, we're still on a crash course for doom. I guess. So, so kind of was saying, he started this organization called, you know, 350, um, Environment 350. It was 350, 350. About 10 years ago, there was this goal to keep the amount of particles of carbon per million at 350. And they said, if you go beyond 350, it's going to like cause severe warming. So they called the organization 350, because that was like the goal, to keep it under 350. Right now we're at 450, and it's moving up to like 480 real fast. So it's just, there's no, there's no more 350. But he said, it, you know, he's the one doing all the science, he said, even if we change our lives completely, and as in individuals, we reduce our impact, and we are carbon neutral, all of us, all this 15% of really enlightened people. <laughs> We're still screwed. Yeah. So what, what does that leave us with? Like, then, then if I'm, not only is my sitting on the couch not doing anything, but, can, but if, I, if I do something is not doing something. Can I criticize his uh, theory? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Because if 15% of the population change radically their behavior, I assume this 15% uh, have some position in this society. So maybe 1% of this 15% are, can be maybe in executive role in some companies or in governmental agencies, and then their effect will be meaningful. Mm naturally, because they have this position. So I think it's not just to look at, uh, about their life. It's, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's not the whole picture. Yeah, hopefully one of the 15% will be like the chairman of the board of you know, of Exxon Mobile, <laughs> then, and, then, and then we are okay. Uh, and, then, and even then he's going to be voted out. <laughs> like, because the other ten members of the board are like, maybe, but you know, <laughs> is, is your like daughter a Greenpeace activist? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, <laughs> if he's smart, he can do it. You know, he can, yeah. he can make the right decision. And I think we can see it sometimes in history that it's not the right people in the right places can make a lot of effect. Yeah, but again, I think the the point that I'm getting to with this is that on that level. If we're talking about oh what each what individual can do, it's not significant. Okay, it's not. But no person lives as an island. This is this is the where we need to think about how we have ripple effects and how interbeing comes into play. The Dharma of your life is that it influences others without it being direct. So our um, faith, and it really is a faith, because a faith I'm not talking about in something that is like outside of your experience. I'm talking about faith in something that's in your experience, but not necessarily within your immediate perception. This is what I'm talking about. It's faith in the unseen. 
but not necessarily unproven. It just, and if you recall, when I talked about um, the quality I intentionally brought up at the beginning of our evening was patience. More than this whole drive to um, make change, and often the drive is to change others. But the faith in Dharma, really, is that by transforming yourself, your effect is infinite. Right? Your effect then goes beyond whatever you can measure. And so the true responsibility is transforming yourself. But is it by transforming, you know, my carbon output and the trees and the hybrid car, whatever? Like, sorry. <laughs> but is it, you know, about measuring that and about, you know, organic food and all this sort of lowering my consum- consumption? Like, who's that minimalist Japanese woman, Mary Kud? Kondo. Kondo. Okay, great. Like, let me clear out my house so I have more room to buy from her website, (laughs) right? (laughs) Which is actually what happens. Um, (laughs) It's the outer things, and this is where I think Bill McKibben is right, but he's not looking at it from a transformative Buddhist point of view. He's looking at it as a measurable science. Outerly, okay, it's not going to, the math won't add up. But in Dharma, that's not how we measure our transformation. We need to combine it with an <coughs> inner transformation. Right? We need to have faith in the, what are called the immeasurables that loving kindness, the metta, the compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. We need, they're called immeasurables because we can't say, okay, I've done this much, and that's like 10 carbon points. Like It's not going to measure it like that. Um, our faith has to be that these are immeasurable. And that's how we can deal with numbers that are very disturbing. They will disturb you, but you need to find the equani- equanimity within you to say, my practice you know, is pure, and it's immeasurable. I need to have faith in that and I think that will carry you so that when there is a lot of bad news and it may get worse before it gets better or it may get worse and not get better but there's a sense of the not knowing the need to know is greedy okay the need to have proof is selfish and I'm saying from your inner transformative point of view. If you need to prove your love, you know, that's because you want positive feedback. But if you want to give your love, you don't need the world to affirm you. Altruistic love, metta, is giving without wanting something back. Even if what we want back is that the world's going to survive and everything's going to be good. Because, yeah, on one level, that's why we practice. We want to end the suffering. That may not happen in our lifetimes. But that doesn't give you a pass not to practice. It may go way down before you finished here on this earth. But your faith has to be that you are contributing something that is immeasurable here. <clears throat> and therefore you don't need something back <clears throat> I know this is you know it's a very challenging approach but otherwise you're going to despair and that doesn't help anybody especially you <clears throat> and I'm not saying close your eyes to the suffering and the misery and the really disturbing predictions which are only going to increase in their severity (coughs) but your metta your kindness your compassion is not in competition 
with the negativity of the world, right? You're not like saying, okay, it's too much, so I'm not, I don't have enough meta for this. It's a different scale. <clears throat> So it brings us back to um, <laughs> how does your meditation help with this? The practice of meditation, as I described perhaps too succinctly, is the approach of letting go. Specifically the three fires, and appropriately they're called fires, you know? <laughs> Because it heats yourself. Before the global warming happens, you get hot. Okay? Global warming is a response to the heat that each person feels. And together, it makes everything a lot hotter. What are those fires within you? They are attachment, aversion, and delusion. Okay? They are wanting, 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 not wanting, not wanting. They are liking, disliking. They are desire and hatred or anger and attachment and the delusion of not understanding yourself and your place in this world. Mm -mm. So those three fires are really what we're trying to put out. And when those fires are put out, then the world is a cooler place. And when collectively they're put out, then the heating, we're, we're adding less heat into the environment. We want less. We expect less. Okay? We hate less. And all of that creates a different inner environment and then naturally outer environment. So if we really want <coughs> to deal with the outer climate, our practice is dealing with the inner climate. What's the weather system like in you, in your mind? What's the weather system of your mind, okay? Is there, you know, some <laughs> warming going on? Do you have too much smoke so it's not clear? Are there too many carbon particles in your brain <laughs> so you don't see so clearly? Clear the smoke. Look clearly. <clears throat> see through the illusion. The illusion of self. The illusion of this that I'm attached to is going to give me lasting happiness. This that I have aversion to is really threatening me. Mm -hmm. Those are the real fires. That's the real global warming. Because it's the inner globe which then finds expression in the outer globe. Mm -hmm. This is what our practice is about. And yes, it is. It means that by sitting calmly and peacefully, letting go of these, you know, disturbances <clears throat> you are actively changing the inner and outer world so this dichotomy of saying that there is like a, a sitting practice and then there's engaged practice is a false dichotomy because if you put out the fires in your mind then wherever you go you, you're more active in an assisting way, in a beneficial way. But if you haven't put out those fires, and you go into the activism saying, I'm going to express my compassion now, you know, stop what you're doing. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just, you know, adding the fire, adding heat to, adding friction, and friction is heat, to an already loaded situation. <clears throat> Does it mean that you wait until you're fully fire free, until you go out and try to help? No. But you notice that when your fires are starting to get stronger, it's time to step back. Because otherwise you might lead to unwise action. <coughs> so you have to be really aware. Okay, that's the mindfulness from moment to moment. <coughs> What's the state of my mind now? And if you start to feel the heat rising, you have to actively <coughs> make efforts to put out those fires. Which fires? The greed, the aversion, 
the delusion in your mind. Mm. Notice them arise when you interact with people you don't like, when you interact with people you like, you know, when you see situations that upset you. Notice how your mind becomes smoky and you no longer see clearly. What do I mean I don't see clearly? The illusion is that there's self and other, that there's friend and enemy, that there's me and the person in the way of my happiness. <laughs> whether it's the car in front of me or whether it's the person at work or whether it's someone in my family, you know, you are blocking me from being happy. That's delusion. And that is a fire. It burns you and it burns them. It makes the world a hotter place. When we want to deal with climate change, yeah, please. Sorry, I might be really stupid, but I'm not following. Uh, if I put out the fire within me, mm. what does that have to do with carbon emissions? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Because part of what we're doing in terms of the global situation, what we're trying to do within our own uh, minds is to let go of some of the self-centeredness which leads to um, my self-centeredness, meaning I'm living my life according to my own personal needs and you know, trying to fulfill my desires. I don't mean just like desires to consume, but you know, I'm kind of the center of my world. <clears throat> when I um, behave or relate to my life and to others in that way, then the world is more a means to the end of my happiness, my satisfaction, right? So it's kind of a zero-sum relationship, we say. It's like, you know, me and you. So I'm kind of using the world for me. Right? Which, I mean, how does that lead to carbon, more carbon emissions? Well. We'll consider more whether the actions I'm taking are of greater benefit or just serving myself. You know? So how can I think in terms of more um, what's necessary not just for my own personal good, but for the greater good? But when I'm just in my own self and I'm like angry at someone or loving someone or desiring this and not desiring that, no. That's a small place. That's not seeing, for lack of better words, the unity. Yeah. So one of the um, fires is the delusion I'm talking about. There are three main fires. There's one that is called like attachment, meaning I like, I like, I like, or I want. It's like running on desire. There's aversion, which is like I don't want, I don't like. And there's delusion which is not really understanding the nature of the self. And the nature of the self is that you're not separate from others. That's the true nature. So when I'm acting on my own likes and dislikes, <coughs> I'm reinforcing that sense of separation. But, you know, um, this, a lot of terms that you do seem to be, seem to me to be very open to interpretation. If, if, if there is no separation between me and other people, I can uh, think of uh, the people who are uh, ostensibly problematic as a, a cancer. If I have a cancer, I go and get, get cancer treatment, which kills the cancer cells. So what you're saying does not, in my opinion, lead necessarily to less uh, violence, less uh, uh, use of resources. I can be interpreted in many, in many different ways. Well. But that interpretation, I mean, if we call it interpretation, means that you're just, <coughs> instead of seeing a harmony or a sense of unity between self and other, meaning that you're not separate from them, that's kind of interpreting or understanding it as, it's not that you're part of them, but rather they're part of you. Well, it's 
you see? works both ways. From I mean, a... I suppose, but, uh, you know, if I am a cancer cell, I still want to win. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I guess intellectually we could think of it that way, and that's why we have to take these, um, oh, understandings and put it into practice. Because remember, the main thing we want to do, the main intention here, is to end suffering. This is where the Dharma kind of informs us. How do we end suffering? And how do we see that it's not just my suffering, but it's everyone's suffering? that my suffering is not separate from other people's sufferings. The uh, truest suffering, I mean one of the truest sufferings, is the suffering of death. So to consider, I guess, other um, people and illness is to wish them death, which is wishing them the greatest suffering. So it kind of contradicts the whole project of the Dharma, which is to end suffering. So we, we we have to keep that in mind that the point of this whole approach is to reduce all suffering. No, it's good. No, you 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 have another question though. It's been going for five hours. So, so here's just to summarize that this answer. The Dharma as a whole, the bottom line of the Dharma is to end suffering. That's what it's all about. (coughs) And we can't, I mean, we can't (coughs) even start thinking about putting out fires, about attachment, aversion, delusion, about self and other, about emptiness of self, about interbeing, about all these terms, unless we understand why am I trying to understand myself as not separate? Because separation in some way leads to suffering. When I feel alone, lonely, and then I want to fill that loneliness with, like, things. You know, thinking those things will help me. And because I feel separate from other <coughs> people in a real basic way, <coughs> I start taking refuge, instead of in unity, I start taking refuge in objects. I mean, that's the basic message we're given, is that, you know, if you own more, you'll be more secure. I mean, it's not just a capitalist dream, it's just the material life, the material world we live in, is that, you know, house, car, job, things, morning coffee, you're okay. But because I'm lonely and unhappy, I keep wanting more because it seems not to work and yet I don't know if this doesn't work, then I just need more of what's not working. You know, hopefully it'll someday work if I get enough. (coughs) Step back from that and you look at the nature of desire. And so that always wanting more is something I'm getting. that. That goes back to the carbon output, <laughs> you know. I mean, so remember we want end suffering. Remember that we end suffering by ending attachment or desire. Okay, that's the second noble truth. Right? By ending desire, suffering is ended, and there's a way to do that. Those are the Four Noble Truths. We don't take them on faith. We take them by looking at them in our lives and looking at my relationship to the physical world and to other people and saying, is the way I've been working so far, has that worked in creating greater true happiness and less suffering? Has that worked? And in some ways it has, and in the ways it hasn't, why? And how can I make it work? You know, it's not all or nothing here, okay? Um, Somebody started saying something, and it's you. I just want to say that I don't think it's that simple living in this society that we live in, okay? You don't (laughs) really have a choice. Like, you're saying things that um, I'm trying to do in my everyday life, and it just feels impossible because it's not the same mentality. I live in a, like a whole different mentality. 
Mm. Right? This room is a whole different mentality. That's what I think. Mm. So it's it has to be more practical. Mm. Yeah. Here we're we're among the ten percent nobody's on the board of governors of some agency. Unless you are, talk to me. But um give me give me a job. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> How do we cultivate without making it dualistic? Yeah, I think it's important to say most of the time we're in environments that talking about this is not helpful and it's a huge challenge just to remember it ourselves. Yeah, um, there is a, a teacher I had named David Loy. He runs a retreat center. He's a Zen teacher and runs, he opened up a place called the, an Echo Dharma Retreat. It's in Colorado in the mountains. It's like way from everywhere. And he runs these Echo Retreats. And he's written a lot of books on the Echo Dharma and everything. And basically, his suggestion was, he gave three, three suggestions. And I found them realistic. It wasn't about like changing everything right now. It was three simple things. Spend more time in nature. That was number one. Like just simple, simple, simple. Spend more time in nature. It's not that simple. Most of us work most of the time. So it's yeah. not that simple. We don't oh. this kind of life. We don't have this kind of life. We live in modern lives. We don't have time to spend so much time in nature, or a little it more have to time. Be so much, it's just a bit more than what we're <laughs> doing no. now. If you go for half an hour, try 40 time. minutes. You don't have to. There's just just a little, just a Whatever you're doing that seems to give you peace, and I actually have a strong, um, not faith, but my experience of being in a natural environment is it generally does more in an immediate way than meditation. Yeah, so, I agree. So but doing that, giving yourself the gift of putting yourself in that environment will heal your mind in a way that you don't need convincing. So if you can give yourself, it's no longer than a struggle to say, like you just recognize, what's my state of mind here and what's my state of mind here? I'm going to try to spend a little more time where it seems a better state of mind. Like, yeah, you're not going to be changing your job and your place of living, but <coughs> I, yeah, some, I some people can. You, Why you not? can, <laughs> no, I, but if you if you can't, okay, you can. But let's say you can't. For most of us, ninety percent of us are going to be. You know, in this urban environment, in sanghas that are not supportive, and having to like try to survive. I do believe that everybody, no matter where, who, or what you're doing, can take more time in a natural environment. And it will give you an immediate feedback. So, that, when I said simple, it didn't mean that. Yeah, now you can spend 30 hours a week doing that. No. But if you get outside for half an hour a week, make it 45 minutes. All right. that, that's all. Like, just more will cultivate an appreciation and a value. The word in English is called reverence. Reverence. Right? Because you are putting yourself in a, a place that you don't control, right? And it's not under human control. It's got its own rules. And that is humbling. That makes us feel like instead of it having to fit into me, I have to fit into it. Well, that's a real special thing. There's a shift there that it's, I know they're always like cultivated by humans, these natural spaces are all, you know, but try to go as, as I think next week or two weeks or Lital left, yeah, but you're going out in the desert. That's probably the only wilderness in Israel that's kind of existing, right? 
And that gives you a sort of an opportunity to um, experience a non-human environment. Okay, a non-human environment, you get off the road. I mean, it's all somewhat, it's all a matter of degree, isn't it? It's all a matter of degree. But you will experience something different than if you go to, I don't know, Parky or Con or something, like go walk along the river. It's nice, but it's not necessarily going to change your mind during that time. You're still going to be surrounded by people and cars and everything, and you got some grass. Good. I mean, I go there too. But when we're talking about nature, we're saying, what happens to your mind? And I'm not saying it will happen. I'm saying, investigate. Investigate what happens to your mind when you take at least an hour in a non-human environment. Just like, see that as an experiment. You know? Check that out. I'm good. That, that's one thing he says. Okay, And then his suggestion <coughs> is, Understand the Dharma, approach the Dharma in a way that helps you understand your relationship to the outside world, not just your relationship to the inner world. Right? What do the teachings of Dukkha, Anicca, and Anatta, how do they relate to <coughs> meaning of suffering? of impermanence and of non-self how does that express itself when you are in the desert or when you're on a busy street how do you understand those teachings when you're walking <coughs> and there's a siren blaring of an ambulance like how do you understand that see the dharma as something that informs your <coughs> daily life you know, if you want to be an activist, a Dharma activist, bring it into your actions. That's how we become a Dharma activist. Is take these teachings of Dukkha Anitta, mm -hmm. you know, Anatta, Anicca and Anatta, of the Four Noble Truths, you know, of the Eightfold Path, and see how it you walk with it. You know, in the supermarket, on the street, at work. Yeah, maybe not on na in nature, but if you want to um, explore freedom bring it into where you don't feel free <clears throat> so <What's> the, third? <laughs> the the third one was then taking the insights you get and then becoming actually more active with them, making it more a conscious uh, way of life. I have a question about it. Mm. It's really concrete. Mm. And say so you're thinking about what's happening in Australia and on the fire and so on. Mm. And say you want to bring awareness because we believe not everybody actually know or think about it. And you post the Facebook post or something. And, and it has a little bit of frustration or anger or, or sadness or whatever. And, uh, well, it's not really a fight or an activism, but it's a kind of an act. And uh, I just wonder about it because you say, oh, it can bring uh, friction and it's not really harmonic or holistic to people, but you're trying to actually... Um, <coughs> I don't know uh, how to say it, but you're thinking in, a, in um, not you want to make some change for for a good matter, right? For a good cause, because someone else is suffering, and so there is a purpose to bring up the friction and the anger about some institutions or politicians, etc. Mm. So how do you see that? I mean, I I cannot really resolve this conflict. Mm. Yeah, I think one of the traps, one of the dangers of social media is that the audience is not always, um, you're not in control of the audience. Meaning, when the Buddha taught, <coughs> he taught with Upaya, which was called skillful means that to every person that he taught to, like he knew what that person needed and he knew how to talk to that person. That was kind of a, a high value of a teacher. When you put something out on social uh, media, you don't really know who the audience is so much. 
So you don't know whether this message is going to be skillful or not. That, I mean, maybe if you know exactly who you, the people are who are going to read that, then you'll know it'll be effective. But a general message is sometimes helps and sometimes doesn't help or does the opposite or creates like friction. So I, I would say it depends on how well do you know the audience. <laughs> are they going to be receptive? I feel that that's the last thing we can do is, you know, if we're not real activists and we, get, we don't really fight for it in our everyday lives and connect with the right uh, environment or uh, uh, the real people who do the change uh, through lawyers, offices, etc. Which I really, you know, I kind of like, go do this fighting for us. Yes, you're wrong. So if all I can do is post this thing, then I will, because I don't know who it will reach, and maybe I hope that one percent of one person who reads it can actually mm -hmm. do some more change than I can. That that's my innocent uh, mm -hmm. hope, actually. Maybe I mean, so <coughs> maybe I I just um I think though the only the only statement that I would question there was the only thing I can do is is like post that. And I think that what you can do is um, only limited by all the actions you do. Meaning, <laughs> everything you do is what you do. <laughs> it's, every action is an expression of this, and every interaction you have with someone, it may not be to some, you know, you may not be, I don't know, talking to a crowd or a group or something, but it may be one or two people that you interact with today or tomorrow that you share some concern with. And that may be as or more effective than sending something general out to 500 people. I think that it's more, um, I think that intention we need to be, we need to have <coughs> more of is what is going to be uh, skillful, helpful, and um, reach its destination. And I think um, if, if you think, you know, in your own uh, consideration that that's going to help, then that's your, you know, um, you know, that's your understanding and that's probably the right one. But um, I think that at every moment we're wanting to think, okay, what's going to help the most here? And it could be with someone you know, someone you don't know. It could be a personal interaction. It could be like just a chance interaction. I mean, I think there's always... I'm always surprised at how um, strangers, <coughs> people I don't know who I have interactions with, tend to change my perception of a whole day. You know, and. And we are that stranger to others. And I think that's a, um, a profound way of relating. That we may be the agent of change and insight for people who we won't remember. <laughs> but if we make sure that we have that good heart everywhere, then it's definitely going to spread. <clears throat> this is not abstract, okay? This is moment by moment the person I'm looking at now. And that's, I think, where we should be aiming at. <clears throat> I think you talked about it um, a week ago or two weeks ago about, um, <coughs> about compassion. What, what, what can you do? What's that? Thinking that you know we can change the world, I think it's um, yeah. People should. I th I really sh should start with the, the person in front of them. You know, so there's global change. Okay, so if you you, you want to do something, so okay, let's start with someone outside in the street that maybe needs some, I don't know, shelter, food, whatever. You know, start with that. 
I don't know, consume less, eat less uh, dairy and meat. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that you can do. Um, you, you can post something on Facebook. It not necessarily needs to be uh, controversial. <coughs> just post something <coughs> to, to, so people would, would be aware. There's no, no harm about that. <coughs> but there's a lot of things that you, know, you can donate money for for people in Australia, in Gaza. You don't need to go so so far for to look for people that, that suffer. So there's like a lot of stuff that uh, you can do. But I think that the actual, I think it was Gurdjieff in Ostensky's book, that, you know, like thinking that someone actually has, um, someone actually can change the <coughs> result of that, you know, work like globally, you know, war or whatever. We can't really. We can just like work on ourselves and and suffering within ourselves and the people around us. I think that's something like that. When Mahatma Gandhi got on the last train before he was shot and he was going to the border of uh, Pakistan and India, where they're having the big like oh old massacres and riots, and he went there to try to stop it. And before he was assassinated by a Hindu extremist, reporters came to the train, and he was already a big star, and they asked him, you know, what's your message to everyone at this time of, you know, incredible, like, rupture? And I don't know how many millions of people died during that time, right? And he said, you know, my life is my message. And I, I really think that that's... It's just true. I mean, some statements are just true. And, you know, we, our job then is to try to aspire, to aspire for that, <coughs> which is not a higher goal. It's, it's aspiring for your own life, the truth of your life. And yeah, for some people it may be working in Gaza, and for some people it may be cleaning up bottles on the street, and for some people it may be homelessness, but you only know what your action is when your mind is clear. So in our Dharma practice, we're wanting to clear our minds from the greed and from the hatred. And then there's a clarity. Oh yeah, this is what's needed now. This is where I can answer. This is the call I can answer. Because I'm not lost in my own selfishness. I'm not saying like you should be criticized, I'm so selfish. We all are. That's just the <coughs> conditioning of our lives. So, sit with great ease. <laughs> be patient so that you can really find yourself here. And then, give as much as you can. <laughs> And go for a walk in the woods. Mm -hmm. That's also highly recommended. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm, uh, I apologize for going longer than anticipated. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for your practice tonight. And I really... Thank Glad you. we're on this journey together. <coughs> mm. Should have a good week. <laughs>